Welcome, everyone. This is Inauguration Day, January 20th, inauguration of the new version of To Debate. Yes, we have been running this for 100 episodes. And as we've mentioned in our last episode, we are reformatting the To Debate podcast. It's still about debating. It's still about business and politics and tech. It's still with my good friend and co-host, Dirk. And hey. he's here. Is he online? Yes, he is here. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy Inauguration happy New Day. Year. Yes, Happy Inauguration Day. And every other episode from now on will also welcome another co-host, which is not just me, in case you're wondering. It is Lydia. Hello, Lydia. Hi there. And no, I'm not another clone of Sebastian. <laughs> I am well, a real, <laughs> a real uh, other person. Well, Full technically, person. you're a woman. Oh, yes, absolutely. You're another person. Yes. Absolutely. Another <laughs> human being. Well, technically, you're partially my clone because you're my younger sister. Ooh, and that's not a joke because I joke a lot. But you're actually my younger sister, younger by six years almost to the day. Yep. I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> Yeah, in the family, the running joke is that I'm the draft, and then there's two brothers, and then the princess, the genius, Lydia, has come. Well, what are you today, actually? Tell us more about you. <laughs> I'm the perfect human being. That's it. Ah, the perfect human being. Oh, yeah. I, I, um, I see that family, that the family is all, <laughs> everyone in this family is so humble. It's like... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your compliment, Derek. I, I love that compliment. It's very rare that people say this with actual honesty. Thank you. So, Lydia, uh, I'll, I'm going to introduce you. You have three master's degrees, uh, which you've obtained only two, only over two. the years. What? Only two. All right, only two. Well, okay. It's it's always good to know about more about your sister. Uh, <laughs> I think you have three, but that's that's my opinion. You're an engineer and an architect, correct? Yep, exactly. And you've worked and building, my, of building my my company, my architecture company, right right now this this week. So so yeah, that's a big project. Wow, for me right now. Yet another inauguration. Another yeah, inauguration. Exactly. Another inauguration. This is actually kind of my yeah my personal inauguration day. So what what type of engineering? Well. Uh, civil engineering, so structure, thermal, acoustic, all that kind of uh, anything that has to do with the the building. And so, just to finish off the introduction, uh, my sister is a bit of a uh, a small genius, small in the sense that she's small, like height wise, uh, because she started university at sixteen years old. She has skipped two years at school. She went to the most elite engineering school or university called Ecole Polytechnique, for those who know. Uh, so that's the military school created by Napoleon 200 years ago, so that officers in the army would be recruited among those who have brains, not just those who do not. Um, and then in addition of that, the way the system works in France is when you go to that elite engineering university, you also get the degree from another elite engineering school. It's a very peculiar system. That's why I said you get two degrees. Don't contradict me because I'm your <laughs> elder brother and it's not a debate. This is me presenting you. And you have the architecture degree. So I am in good company because you, Dirk, I just to remind our listeners, you also have a couple of degrees. Do you want to remind our listeners what's um, your background? Yeah, Because we may have new listeners, right? Joining the show is going to be a new format. We'll explain what it's about. But let us have a bit of background about you. Uh, well, I was a late starter when it comes to university. So the, the years that Lydia started early, I started late. Um, I was already working when I decided to do the school thing again. By now, I have a degree in business science. I have another degree in computer science. And I have a third degree. Well, not finished degree working on it in psychology. So those are the the three areas I'm I'm most curious about. Aside and from, from general German interest. and British universities, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, correct? for the most part. Uh, actually all all yeah, all, all degrees are uh, British universities. So it's uh, University of Liverpool that gave me my masters and the Open University, which if I'm not mistaken, is the oldest and largest distant learning university in the world, actually based out of Milton Keynes. Yeah, so how about you? Very classic engineering degree and just general stuff in, in theory, electronics and telecommunications and then an MBA that I did right after my engineering studies. But I think what we share in common here, the three of us, is a 
deep interest in the news, in politics, in thinking, philosophy, and just uh, debating in general. I think we have uh, all of us an interest in the arts as well. You, Dirk, in photography. Lydia, it's very wide ranging. Uh, do you want to talk about what what is your interest in the arts? Well, I I like uh, um, uh, what in French we call a uh, uh, spectacle vivant. I don't quite know what this how this would. It's like circus, like uh, circus. Uh, circus theater, anything that is uh, the dance, the, the, the performing uh, arts. Performing, performing arts, arts exactly. exactly. You, performing arts. So anything that has to do with um, placing your body and your voice in front of other people and trying to express emotions or 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 political or otherwise uh, motions through that that medium. And so yeah, interaction and I think that has also something to do with with uh, psychology somehow probably. So all right. And on my side, I also I'm a big fan of photography, but not as good as Dirk. And what I've lately started doing is playing the ukulele. I used to play the piano, and I just bought an ukulele just a month ago. So if you really beg hard, I will play oh, yeah. you a song. Yeah, yeah, come Maybe on, come day. on, give something. Not now. Shut, no, we I have hear something. To do. We have business to stop begging, Dirk. No, it's um, not for you. Not uh, now. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> you cannot say <laughs> I started learning the ukulele. You, uh, earlier, you even and showed it to us, show. and then you're not. Yeah. yeah, come on, come on, something, something We're, small. We will do something if if you win. One of what's going to happen <laughs> in the next hour. Uh, Dave has, beca has become a chicken. All right. What we're going to do is not just one debate, not two debates, but three debates. Here's the thing. We'll have Lydia every other episode. We'll be releasing roughly, uh, I guess, two episodes a month on average from now on. That's our objective. Every other will be with Lydia. So we will have three motions. That's the special thing. Um, that our listeners get. And every other time, it will be either just you and me, Dirk, or if one of our listeners or one of our guests, potential guests wants to join, then they're happy to just email us and we'll consider that. Yeah. So the way we're going to run this, uh, we're going to expose one motion, each of us, to the rest of the gang here, the three of us, and we're going to have a conversation and debate the pros and cons, just like uh, we would debate the pros and cons previously, except we're going to do this in more of a conversation manner as opposed to a formal debate when we were doing the 12-minute rigid format structure in the past. At the end of these three segments, which will last about 15 minutes, uh, we will have some uh, nice interview questions and some trivia questions that I will be asking Lydia and Derek and see how they do with those questions. We will see what happens. No pressure. Get started? No pressure at all. All right, Lydia, we'll start with you. You came with a motion today or a topic at the very least. Uh, why don't you tell us what you came up with and your initial thoughts about that topic before Derek and I chime in. Okay, let's do this. <laughs> Uh, okay, so what I wanted to, to talk about with you today is um, about social media and censorship. In the past weeks, we've had uh, Twitter shutting down Trump's accounts, first te temporarily, then permanently. And so I was wondering, should social media be allowed to censor user content? And in what, uh, to what extent uh, should they be allowed to do so? Um, so on the one side, some consider that censorship, whatever form it takes, is unacceptable because it's contrary to freedom of speech, uh, which is uh, fundamental to democracy. So any kind of censorship is a threat to democracy. And on the other side, at the same time, uh, social media has been urged to bring down content that is violent, homophobic, anti-Semitic, for example. And in the past, uh, fingers have been pointed when platforms like Twitter or Facebook have delayed removal of uh, this um, violent content. So, so what to think of uh, Twitter shutting down Trump's accounts? I'd like to hear your your thoughts on that. Since I started, I guess I'll let you. I'll give you the honor of choosing a side, or at least sharing your thoughts first. Interestingly, we had a debate. It was our thirty third where we dis debated, should Twitter ban Trump? And back then, I argued for that. 
and I, I that's the side I'm going to pick. I will argue for it. Um, if anything, I, it feels for me like it's too little, too late. So the the whole the whole social media banning that goes on right now with Trump, um, it it is very opportunistic and it's uh, very very complete right now. So that makes me feel uneasy. But in general, it's not really censorship because uh, first off, they can still they can publish books. They they probably find a microphone they can speak into. They can publish a web page. They can go to other places. So it's still not it's not stopping them from voicing their their grievances and opinions. And and secondly. I do believe it was long overdue that Twitter actually followed their own community guidelines and others uh, too, because um, in the past, Trump overstepped the line so many times where everyone else on this planet would have actually ran into trouble with, with Twitter. And inciting basically violence and, and steering a mob would be something that is not censorship if you stop it. It's basically a matter of security for your users. So I'm... I'm looking at this with a little bit of puzzlement and feel like it's, uh, as I said, too little, too late, and it feels like not really very honest, but it's long overdue and probably should done for uh, should be done for others too. Sebastian, how so are you I'll, feeling about this? I'll actually I'll take the opposite stance more naturally, but I did prepare both sides, so we'll have a, an interesting conversation. The first thing I'll say is three words: I miss Trump. I have to admit. I, Why am I not surprised? I, oh my I God. miss Trump on Twitter because now I have to admit, I feel a bit uh, ashamed of checking his Twitter account. So ashamed that I am sure some of, my, some of our listeners have probably done the same that I've done, which is to open an incognito window and then type Twitter Trump and then go to see his Twitter feed uh, so that it doesn't go into your uh, browser history or your recommendations of future content to read. I would do this systematically, and now it's all silent. I have no way to have fun at what this silly guy would would say. Um, I'm serious. I actually, it's uh, it leads me to a serious uh, point, which is two points. One, um, ban posts, not people. I think this is where social media companies should not intervene unless it is a direct requirement by law, by a regulator, or by a decision of justice. And I think that was the main point that Lydia was trying to raise, which is, should it be in the authority of social media companies to actually act in that power? You're saying it's long overdue, Dirk. I really think this is not something social media companies should be doing. And I recognize that you and I both work for Google, so we have to be careful. We're not talking about YouTube, even though a lot of what we say is also applicable to a company like YouTube. Um, but my general stance is first, ban posts, specific posts, not people. That's a, a principle uh, that we can talk about. Also, the aspect of permanent censorship for life and kicking someone off a platform also seems way out of proportion so with the way you deal with things. Wait, one more thing. The second argument, uh, which is underpinning my opinion, is if you shut people off, they will go underground the same way when you take drugs uh, off a uh, semi-legal kind of environment, like in Amsterdam, what is being discussed at the moment, banning the usage of cannabis by foreign, uh, by people who are not residents of the Netherlands. It will go underground. People would buy and sell drugs in the street, the same way Trump and far-right racists will find other avenues to discuss and so plan attacks. Here, here I have I'd to stop you. I'd to be in the open. Dear, <laughs> two things. First off, floor. if you if you want to have this uh, legalized, fine. But Twitter is not owned by the U.S. government, nor is any of the other social media companies. It's private companies. They can decide what happens on their platform. So far, they decided to let him reign freely. And I think it is overdue that they actually stopped him. You know, you cannot post a picture with a, with a female nipple on it. But Trump was basically threatening nuclear war on Twitter without being um, stopped. So I, I, do, I do say they can do that and it's okay. If you, if you really want to have something Twitter-like and be it a, a, a place where you can completely um, voice your opinion and have that free-ranging conversation and not being kicked out, then states need to run these platforms. Until we do the uh, do so, I think uh, we have to live with the fact that companies can make the call themselves. And it's, it's a fair call to make. It's not censorship in that sense. Now, Trump had 88 million followers. That means 
probably two and a half million people who really think he's somebody they need to follow. And 85 something million Sebastians out there who were either for professional reasons or for personal reasons following the entertainment. Now, let Trump move on to some fringe corner of the internet and those two or three million people should go with him and be surrounded by as many FBI agents as actually follow Trump. Those five million people should have fun over there and we have a more quiet place in the internet uh, as a result. That's what I would answer to you. But I really at this point i really i really wonder lydia if you if you hear, hear your brothers and my rambling what where do you land on this well i am going through a few articles on this um i can understand that censorship is has always been uh, a tool for preventing social unrest and uh in that sense to some extent it is necessary. I mean, shutting down homophobic, uh, anti-Semitic content or preventing harassment on social media platforms. I mean, that is obviously something that is necessary. Uh, taking down pornographic content of uh, children, some uh, stuff like that. Okay, of course, we need to, to make sure that the internet is sane. Um However, this is for me, this is very sensitive uh, topic because, of course, people who have the power have the power to say which content is good and which is bad. Basically, what is good is what is, go is going to serve their interests. And, and so, obviously, we can't uh, change the system we're in, the political, social system that we're in, if we can't have a debate on what is considered good and bad. And having businesses uh, deciding unilaterally which content is good or bad without even the possibility of a democratic debate about this, this makes me feel very nervous. So I am, I, I, I'm not pro-Trump, but I think that he is a political figure. He has uh, something to say that millions of people agree with across the, across the, the world. And shutting him down is only to some extent, it's even le le legitimizing what he's saying because these people feel like they don't have a, a good representation. And so shutting him down is actually reinforcing what he is saying. So I'm, I'm very, I'm very uncomfortable actually. I'm picking sides uh, on this, on this specific uh, event of Trump's account. I guess you Probably, have a point. I would, have, I would have been against because I'm all for freedom of speech. But I mean, it's a little bit like I said, right? It's too little too late. I wish he would have been reined in much earlier. Right now, it feels like they only they only dare to do that because they know he's on the way out. That's why why it it felt it felt to me like, uh, you know, Trump t to some degree was a nuisance to many, many people. But right now, now that uh, social media companies know he cannot really damage them right now because he's on the way out, they feel safe to act on this. Um, of course, they would not have shut down his yeah, account I agree. As, yeah. as he was uh, as he as he was in the in the Capitol because in the sorry in the White House uh, because he could have taken political action against against them. So of course, it would have been very very bad for business. And this is not a political uh, or even a social. Um, uh, action from twitter it is it is business it is making sure that they can't have po fingers pointing at them uh later on by taking action uh and if they haven't done it before it's because it would have been bad also for business because trump could have acted before so i think I this 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 de decision cannot be left to uh to private companies so i agree with you that the official reason that Trump was inciting violence with his two latest posts or tweets after he was banned for 12 hours on Twitter are, I think, the official reasons, but not the real reasons. As you said, Dirk, it's probably taking advantage that he's on the way out, little risk. We want to prepare for the next administration and make sure that we've acted on time. Um, that I that I agree with. I think we we all agree that there is some form of regulation needed. You're saying, Derek, that you're comfortable with private companies, and it was too late. Uh, if anything, uh, you Th those are anything, sorry, right? sorry. Those are two things. Um, and he actually had another debate on this as well. So first off, to to state my clear position, 
I'm not comfortable with us externalizing the task of policing speech and what's acceptable and not to companies. And in actually quite to the contrary, I would I would say it's it's an annoying fact of our the world we live in right now that governments around the world, European no different, um, kind of push away the responsibility of actually coming to clear re- rules and and laws by basically punishing companies for for certain types of content until those companies introduce systems like you know the upload filter that we've been discussing last year in in the, uh, you being an example so i'm not comfortable with the fact that basically governments put it in the hands of private companies because um in our debate where we debated i gave the example of mark zuckerberg who can basically decide what's in inboxes if the inbox lives on Facebook. And that's too much power for a private person that nobody elected and we have no control over what they think. So that's number one. But number two, if we say we do have private platforms there and those private platforms have given themselves guidelines, rules for content, I would say they should apply those rules to everyone in the same way. And they made an exception for the likes of Trump on the grounds that they say Trump is a public figure. The public has an interest to know what he's saying. And this one fact didn't change just, it sounds weird, just because he incited violence, which I would say he did. Um, he's like the, the the front figure of all of this. When he tweets, people are interpreting what he tweets. Um, that this The fact that he's a public figure where the public has an interest to hear him or see him didn't change as an argument. The only thing that changed is that he's on the way out. So I would have wished for Twitter to be really be concise, to apply their own rules to everyone just the same way. And if people start complaining about that, then the governments need to pass laws and regulations that tell Twitter how to behave. But they made an exception for Trump, which is actually the core problem, and they should have stopped doing that um, much earlier than right now. But no, overall, I'm not comfortable. This is this is a mess. I think what you've just put forward is, um, is put, putting the finger on the, the core of this debate. Uh, it all comes down to are these social uh, media platforms media, as in newspapers, that kind of media, or are they, or are they uh, simply tools uh, that anybody should have access to, just like the internet is a tool? So, whether you can, if you consider that it's it's like a newspaper, it's it's it, so it can have um, an editorial uh, line and and choose that it wants to to push a certain kind of content and and to take down an, another type of content, then that's fine. Uh, newspapers are white-wing, left-wing, whatever. If you consider that f- Facebook, Twitter are, are the, new, the new internet, then freedom of speech would command that there would be no censorship. And, and I think that the core of this debate is to, to what end do we, do we use uh, social media platforms, and in certain countries, s- Facebook has so much, so much pushed their platform that people go on consider that f- Facebook is the internet. That in- internet and Facebook is, are synonyms. This is this is how we use these platforms, and so I think this is where the confusion starts to to generate these 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 problems. Yeah. All right. You made me think. Um, let's wrap up. We're beyond 15 minutes. You have one or two sentences, Max, to wrap up your thoughts or your conclusion. Dirk, you get to start. Then Lydia, you can have your couple of sentences. And then I'll wrap up also with a couple of sentences and we'll move on to the next motion. I know it's quick, but we've actually talked for more than 15 minutes about this. Go ahead, Dirk. What is your conclusion or the last, your last words before we hang you? So... You will find a place where you can shamefully follow Trump's ramblings. No no worries. The internet is big and there is no way that he will stay out of all those platforms. What has happened is that he has been deplatformed by private companies. Now, the 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 conclusion maybe is stuff like or uh, services like Twitter are so essential that we need to consider having those as essential services in the internet and regulated properly. It doesn't need to be Twitter. There are alternatives to that. Maybe we need to have some open platform that is protected to what uh, to the extent that Lydia is saying. That's also that also should not be governed by market interest. That should not be 
businesses, it should be a public service then. But yeah, I think it's spot on. If it's media, then different rules apply than if it's a essential infrastructure. For now, I actually welcome having less noise on the internet, and I'm not missing Trump, not even a tiny bit. Please, uh, um, please have all the loons that so far were doing the shouting for him follow him to some corner of the internet, and I personally, I'm totally fine with that. Thank you, dear, for your two sentences plus plus plus. Uh, Lydia, your turn. Your two sentences to conclude. Uh, I'm, I can't uh, choose a side on this topic. Uh, this is why I wanted to to have a chat about it with you. Um, I'm still not I'm still not clear on where I stand. Uh, clearly, I'm happy to have less noise. I'm happy to have less fake news. Less 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 whatever. Oh my god, it was, it was long. Okay, it was long. So I'm happy that it's over. But and it's not even over because there are so many other Trumps around the world. But um, but yeah, I'm still not very, very comfortable with this. And I think what you suggested, Dirk, is can be a, a good, a good way to go um, to have maybe other platforms, infrastructures that can be non-profit, non, non-business uh, that make sure that the infrastructure is is there for freedom of speech with clear regulations. And then if other companies uh, want to 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 propose the same thing um the, uh, the same service um fine but indeed it uh, twitter facebook these have, have become, become part of our of our lives and so we can't just choose to shut shut out people i think what you said sebastian about censorship of content and not people that i think that resonates quite quite well with with my my values, personal values. So all right, yeah. my uh, my conclusion. You made me think, so I came up with something in my head, and here's my my proposal, which is non debatable because I I wrapped this one up. Is simple. I'm going to take a stance. If a social media platform reaches a certain certain threshold, for instance, I'll just throw one out there to be very specific: a hundred million active users on a monthly basis, then that platform loses the right to decide who can get on that platform or not. The only thing that can regulate it is the country, i.e. its laws, and that could be total freedom of speech or regulated by the government. But then I will also, but then please also remove the right to have an algorithm that picks what you see and what you don't see. Because on top of that, platforms like Twitter or Facebook optimize for the rage factor, right? So the more engaging the content, the, the so they, they basically created that following that Trump is losing right now. They gave him those 88 million in the first place. And that's I'm, I'm not thing. commenting on the recommendation aspect. It is true that it's connected to it, but I, I stand by my proposal here, okay. which is to say if you're big enough, i.e. Uh, by active usage, not by revenue, then you lose as a company the right to actually decide who gets on it or not versus your supposed policies that you apply, to your point, Dirk, in an uneven way or depending on whenever the time is right. Anyway, we have to wrap up. We've exposed our arguments. We're well beyond 20 minutes on, on that one. I, I guess we may change our format if we realize that every motion goes on for two days in a row. So let's <laughs> go to your debate, uh, Dirk, your motion. My motion is about the borders closing that we've witnessed in the past, actually years, but especially in last weeks and months. Um, always triggered by something the the latest uh, development in covid um some some refugees they want to cross borders or whatnot so we've seen countries in europe in the us uh, uh, well in the us itself or in other places of the world closing borders and my motion is um i consider that basically theater for the masses or more or less concealed blackmail um, the example that I give that are two. One example I give is um, the the closing of the border in France uh, when they discovered that new variant of COVID in the UK. It it felt very conveniently timing wise to Christmas and the end of the Brexit debates. So it felt very much like, oh yeah, let's let's test for a second how it feels if we are just clo- uh, closing borders for a few days and you have people. Uh, um, in traffic, uh, stuck in traffic jams for for miles on end. Um, the other one is uh, refugees, and the reason I'm saying this is, 
everyone who is actually uh, following this and ha thinks about it sh is probably aware that first off closing borders never stop the virus ever nor will it ever stop a virus it just sounds good to the the everyday joe and the same is true by the way for stopping refugees Trump can build all the walls he wants. People come into his country with airplanes and ships and whatnot. And that is actually as much a problem as having somebody climbing over a wall. So it's theater. Um, yeah, that was my motion. So what do you think, Lydia? Theater or not theater? You start. Well, I quite agree, actually, that um, closing borders is... It's never a good solution. Uh, maybe I can say it like this. People are, not, are never ha happy. Are never happy to 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 flee their own country, their homes. Uh, if they do it, it's that they absolutely need to do it for ec economic, political reasons. So to imagine that closing off bo borders is, go is going to stop that flow, I think is is obviously false. I mean. Right-wing um, leaders say that if you show the close the borders and it's not going to be easy to come in, then people are going to stop coming. They're not coming. They're leaving, actually. They're not coming to our countries. They're leaving their countries. So I think, it, indeed, it's 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 easy uh, intellectually to think that. It's it's comfortable to think that closing borders is going to stop the, the flow, but but in practice, it, it doesn't work. It fails to, to deliver. On the, the epidemic front, I'm a bit more, I'm a bit more skeptical. Um, I think that a lockdown has proved effective. So shutting, shutting down, closing down the borders is a form of uh, national lockdown. So I do believe that closing the borders has had some, uh, something to do with preserving certain areas of the of the world from this epidemic. However, I do agree that that exactly like Facebook and Twitter would not uh, shut down Trump's account as long as they, it can have a, a consequence on them. Then, likewise, uh, political leaders will would not close down borders if it was not in their political interest. Uh, even the timing of the lockdowns, even the timing of the different uh, of the vaccine of the of all these different measures uh, is always very finely tuned to public opinion, uh, acceptability of the different measures that are taken, and in the end, uh, political views of being re-elected or, or whatnot. So, so even if I do believe that closing borders has positive sanitary effects, I, I, I agree with you, uh, Dirk, that um, the reasons that are given uh, publicly are not the real reasons uh, behind the scenes. So I what partially do you disagree and partially agree. And I want to be specific on what I agree and on what I don't agree with. And I think it it it's it depends on the area that you're covering. You talked about Brexit, immigration, uh, and health, COVID, right? As three different use cases. I actually think they are different cases. Brexit and what the French did at the end of December, I think this is the classic French-English war, which will never <laughs> cease. Uh, and I agree with you, it's probably theater, but it was quite entertaining. Uh, I have to say, I always like when the Brits are, you know, well, kicked if in you're the not, ass. If you're not stuck in a, in a, in a car, that is. Of course, is. if you're not stuck. Um, COVID, I also agree with you, Lydia. I do think it has some effect. It's not completely like the Chernobyl cloud which is suddenly stopping at the french border uh, you know we leave it to the germans and the polish and the ukrainians to deal with it of course the cloud went all over the place the virus can be stopped right if you actually do close the border like people are actually not moving in and out it does reduce the infection where i don't agree with both of you is immigration it actually helps uh stopping immigration but it depends on two things it stops illegal immigration if you want to close the border but we have to be specific it does not stop illegal immigration, it makes it harder. It does reduce the flow, but it's still very much there. This is where I agree with you. But we have to be clear, because the far right and racist parties in all of Europe and the US don't make a distinction. They don't really care, right? Immigration for them is the big bad, bad evil, and they don't make a distinction where it would be appropriate to realize that, yeah, you have a value in having highly skilled immigrants, which is basically what every country is trying to do. Uh, whether it's you know a bit hypocritical in the way we deal with migration or not, 
but it does have an effect. Um, and you can see this in the stats of people applying for asylum. And obviously, illegal immigration is hard to track. Okay, Dirk, go ahead. You um, want to react? Yeah, I have I have two reactions to this. So, uh, first off, virus. Most of the time, we react to viruses that we see. And the downside of the virus, and it hit us multiple times in this pandemic, is we usually notice it when it's here. So, that it's too late. Trump closing the border to China, well, didn't didn't stop COVID even a tiny bit. Um, us uh, closing the border to the UK, it was not just France. I picked France as an example because I felt like it was a, the additional element of blackmail that I sensed there. Um, but uh, it's like it didn't stop that that particular variant from from leaving the UK. Quite the contrary, actually, it was already here and it was it's already in several multiple uh, European and non European countries. Um, there were there. Are, I agree. You can try to control the flow. Um, of of people uh, or the virus, but you cannot really expect closing the border to be the solution. It's maybe a tool in a larger arsenal. Great. And then Great. when it comes to when it comes to immigration, closing the border basically increases the number of illegal and dangerous immigrants. It doesn't sh stop people from trying to come. It just changes the way they try to come into that the I country. Don't know. It may increase the share of migrants, which may be, may be more uh, on the illegal side, whether it increases the absolute numbers, that I honestly don't know. But I agree with you on the on your other statements otherwise. In, in, in general, like that, that is a tool against uh, within multiple possible tools, right? Like as you were mentioning, Olivia, around the uh, health aspect. Um, but overall, I, I tend to agree, right, in terms of it is theater, right? It's just this varnish of official reasons. And you know there's tons of really, uh, you know, hypocritical, cynical reasons as to why we're really closing down borders when, honestly, to your point, both of you, we have enough evidence that it generally doesn't really work, at least not on its own. It has to be, including for immigration, you have to have other measures in place so that, you know, there is no incentive for people to move away from their country and go to to another country, for instance. Lydia, you want to react? You're smiling. Yeah. Um, I want to be devil's advocate for a bit. Yeah, we and need that. There's another way of closing borders, which is closing borders to business saying, okay, the US is going to buy only American or Europe is going to buy only European. American and great again. I miss... Sorry, just kidding. And there is, there is uh, something that is uh, defendable in, in that point of view. I mean, putting employment to nationals rather than foreign people makes sense. Uh, saying you need to, to consume locally rather than internationally makes sense to a certain extent and so yeah it's closing borders is actually doing what it says it's doing on that on that yeah. area and i think because th th this was trump's uh big thing make america great again by us make uh us um re-industrialize us etc close the borders to immigrants that steal our, our jobs make sure that uh you're not gonna buy a, a german car rather than a us car this makes sense and if we just say okay it's not true uh, then we lose access to all these people who are convinced that that this is the way to go and I think, yeah, to some extent, it can make sense. So, prove to me that 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 it's hypocritical. Yeah, this is this is not this is not your opinion. You're just trying to take devil's advocate, right? You're saying, okay, we could take the opposite side. Yeah, right. But uh, uh, let me let opinion. me try to tackle it. Let me try to tackle it. Go. Oh, so you have forty seconds. Yeah. <laughs> um, the challenge here is actually it's not working either. Um, why? Um, Trump started that that trade war with China. The result was that he basically he basically slammed tariffs and uh, and um, boycotts on Chinese companies. As a result, China slammed tariffs and boycotts on U.S. companies. Both economies, as a result, 
lost value. And as long as the US believes in a market that solves for everything and free flow of money, they basically didn't resolve for anything. They just made everyone on the planet poorer. So um, there, he, he didn't he didn't add a single single job on the line because there were jobs dying because he burned so much money in the process. So I would even say even even for that stupid uh, stupid use case that he tried to push, he failed in the tools that he deployed. Again, playing devil's advocate, yeah. of course he failed because there's uh, there's a transition time. Uh, you can't just close the borders and expect everything to go fine the next day. You have to the economies have to adapt. Uh, the companies have to, uh, to 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 build up on each side separately. Whereas before uh, they would they would uh, exchange goods or or services. Uh, and so, of course, economies need to adapt. But in the long run, um, it is much more viable to to close borders, uh, uh, function locally, and all the and also all the anti-capitalist, uh, altermondialists. Uh, I don't know how you, you call them in English, but uh, all the people who think that we should decrease our our consumption of goods, of of uh, energy, etc., would would argue that. That this is a, a, or some of them at least could argue that this is this is a way to go. Yeah, to your point, and I'll I'll wrap up on my side. We're also already reaching our time window. Uh, I know it feels quick, but I think with three people, it goes much more quickly. Yeah, and learning. Um, yeah. I, to your point, Lydia, I think within a given system of thinking, if your objective is, let's say, reducing the footprint on the planet. If it's about supporting the local economy, it could make sense, right? If you're within that system of thinking, uh, it it could work. It does not. It doesn't mean it's optimal according to all the dimensions. Let's say growth and productivity, but that's by design, not the target, right? Uh, likewise, you could also say, but this is where we all agree. We seem to agree that if you're a far right, racist, xenophobic. Uh, politician, you're going to say we need to close the border for limiting Im immigration, but we all seem to agree that that's not really a, a tool in itself uh, and by most measures does not work. Uh, in total, I feel that, at least that's my opinion here, my impression of us three discussing, we consider that it's generally a theater, right? It's generally a bit of a joke to try and close borders for any reason, to be honest. Uh, we should probably regulate the flow in some way, but closing down is much more of a show than anything else, at least that's my last words on that motion. Dirk, your turn to wrap up and then Lydia. Yeah, I think, as I said, I feel we are more or less on the same page. I like the playing of devil's advocates because it exposes something that's critical. I think short term, it, and that's, the, that's, why polit that's why populists love the tool. On the short term, it always looks like it's working. The result of closing borders comes with a delay, but the immediate thing, it looks like it's something is being done and it works. Um, and uh, that's where, where I land. And if, if the short-term effect is what you're after, then maybe it's a tool that uh, can be deployed. But most politicians basically do it for sure. Thank you. Lydia, final sentence. Uh, I would... I would not um, put my hands in the fire to say that it doesn't work, whatever the, the, the finality is. Because just to come back on a more consensual topic, on the, on the health aspect, uh, I think that it, it does have an effect. But to answer to your motion, uh, Dirk, uh, yes, I think that when politicians decide to close borders, it can have uh, any um, finality in their in their um, in the way they present it. The actual finality is a political finality, which is always electoral credibility. Yeah. So I would say whatever reason is given, whatever the effect is can be can be seen. The, the actual finality is electoral, and so yes, it's theatre for the masses uh, to to do such an extreme, uh, to take such an extreme decision, whatever the whatever the context. Excellent, and you only have one wild card, not two, to be able to not have an opinion. And I'm, I'm joking; you do what you want, but we should maybe have a number of wild cards where we're saying, "Yeah, I'm not going to choose for and against." <laughs> uh, 
All right. Last motion. With, uh, it's my motion, my 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 topic, which is going to make probably you cringe or laugh. You can choose. Uh, I will read the headline of the article. Denmark launches children's TV show about man with giant penis. Yes, you heard me correctly. And critics critics condemn the idea of these uh, cartoon series about a man who cannot control his penis. This is an animated series for children between the ages of four and eight in Denmark. So the question is, and the debate is, is this acceptable? Yes or no? And I'll leave it to you to discuss. We've I like had a. This. I like this when I come up with a crazy topic. I'm not <laughs> anything. I love that. I'm going to do this every time. Go ahead, Lydia. <laughs> um, this makes me think about a debate we've had in France uh, some years ago about some educational um, um, content that was given to the to the teachers in primary school, uh, and that was destined to show to kids uh, what a woman looks like, what a man looks like um so you could see the policeman with his clothes on and then his, the policeman with his clothes off and this this has uh um, been a big 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 subject of debate of of democratic debate uh, at the time and i'm not sure that we've actually had a consensus um uh reached a consensus uh in france uh, about this but your your motion makes me think about this quite a bit Should, so what's should your kids be able to see, yeah, genitals? <laughs> I would say we create taboos as adults uh, around things that sh maybe should not be viewed as taboo. I mean, the the body is the body. So in itself, I don't think a dick is is taboo uh, to show a, a kid. Just, just to clarify, in this case, the penis is actually not displayed as a real genital. It's a very, it looks like, uh, for those who have not seen this, it looks like an extension of the of the cartoon guy's t-shirt. And yeah. it's this very long kind of tube, which is red and white. And it's almost looks like, I mean, it doesn't look at all like a genital. It looks like a rope yeah. to be very, a very long rope going down in the middle between the legs, just to clarify. So I, was, ahead, I was about to say the same, the same thing. I was about to point to two elements here. Um, so it, it's a cartoon show. And it's a, it's a, a fun guy who has a, a lack of control over himself. But actually, the show doesn't contain any anything sexual. That's maybe the first thing to establish. The, the stories are about him making a fool of himself, doing stupid mistakes, and cleaning up the mess he's producing, right? For some weird reasons, the creators decided that the weirdest element of this guy is that he has like that long genital that we never get to see in that show. It's a, if it would be a tail, then we would all say this is some fantasy guy with a with a snake type tail. But it's in this case, um, as adults, we immediately know what that it's supposed to de depict a genital, but it's ridiculously long. And as you say, it doesn't even look penis-like. It's like a, a long rope, as you said. As adults, immediately people jump to conclusions what they are supposed to imagine here. And I would say it's less than that. Now, the actual question, is it okay if kids are exposed to genitals or whatnot? As a father of four, actually, in total, I would say everything is okay to expose your kid to uh, to. If you're if you're not scandalizing it and if it's done in a certain way that's not damaging that kid, so if it's not threatening to the kid, if it's not depicting anything in a way that's uh, ethical problematic, if it's not producing a picture in their head that that uh, values people less or more based on genitals, if it's not if it's not pornographic in a sense that it's exploiting anything, then of course it is okay. I mean. Kids play, and we are in Europe right now. In Europe, in Europe, you can see when it's warm outside, you can see kids playing naked at the fountain, and there's nothing scandalous about that. For this particular show, if I look at it, I find it ugly and stupid. So it's a marketing gag. That's probably what it is. So they were probably to, in part spatting on the on the the, the shitstorm to publicize them. Yeah, and that's that's all I'm saying to this. So, is it okay? Yes, it is okay under conditions. Okay. Uh, to clarify, also, this is launched by the public TV in Denmark, not some private channel. 
uh, it was also created, I, I believe, from the article with a psychologist who reviewed the material before launching it. I agree with what you both said, um, but I have a caveat, maybe in addition of what you said, Dirk. I agree that it's, uh, I think, better to be upfront and not, as long as it's not pornographic in nature. I'm not going to repeat what you said. And I will add to this that children are generally more quick than parents realize. Uh, we've all been children, but then we forget as we grow up that we actually have many ways to understand things quicker than parents uh, believe that we do. So actually exposing it and having a proper explanation in some way or another, is it, 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 whether it's a cartoon or a documentary, can maybe help. Um, it's very be my point is that it's better to, ex to explain it with a way that is thoughtful rather than let them discover accidentally on pornographic websites or through maybe friends or, or, or whatever. My caveat is as follows. Um, one is, as it's stated in the article that I shared with you, uh, it's a bit of a shame that it's a man in this case. And it's again about the penis as opposed to a woman. You know, we've had enough of a debate over the past few years about the Me Too movement, about, you know, putting the woman uh, back in an equal footing as the man. So it would have been interesting to have, have either a duo. It doesn't have to be every time neglecting the man, but it, it's true, right? It's kind of an obvious one where you could have maybe thought about it. Maybe it's not as easy, obviously, for, uh, I guess, morphologic reasons as to what you can do with one genital or another, but still you can be creative. That's the whole point after all of a cartoon. The second thing, which is, I guess, more, uh, I guess, problematic, um, is that we assume sometimes that these cartoons will be watched or will be um, will be uh, the parents will be around, right? To explain, and I think it's a bit of a, a naive perspective that unfortunately uh, parents who are busy, who have not the best jobs in the world, will not be around to explain things. So if the kid has a question, he or she will probably be left alone. Right, and I I have a slight worry worry not too much with this cartoon in particular, but I have a slight concern that making it a bit too obvious about oh yes indeed kids at that age play with genitals so why not expose it uh, we're not explaining anything it's not pornographic I'm a bit worried it's lacking the explanation actually uh, which most parents who who are well off would actually maybe provide or will be next to the kid it's just a small caveat uh, not a big deal it's probably not exactly in in, uh, in line with emotion. Uh, but it's just a general uh, I, the general concept of, well, you know, what's the role of the parent versus the TV versus the school in terms of exposing difficult topics? And sexuality is probably among the most difficult uh, for for anyone as you grow up. Derek or Lydia? I, yeah, I think that uh, to come back to this debate that we've had in France uh, a few years ago, indeed, it was not about sexuality. It was about the body. And so uh, I agree with what has been said that as long as as there's nothing traumatic, uh, as long as there's nothing pornographic, then it's okay to show the body. What really made, made me, uh, frustrated me at the time is that the whole thing about this being educational content and being, sh that it was shown by teachers explained, um, discussed, that, that it was not just not put in front of the eyes of the of the kids like that with no with no context, with no explanation. For me, it's not exposing them. It's it's yeah. It's yeah, it's discussing, it's it's uh, opening up their minds and saying, okay, well, how do you feel about this? And I think this was so crucial in uh in, in understanding what the whole debate was about and was not enough put forward um i think what you've just said sebastian is 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 very important to, to 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 keep in mind that of course you can't just say it's okay to show penises to kids with no explanation so i think censorship for kids is very important uh as long as uh, there's not there's not somebody around be it a parent a teacher any kind of professional to yeah, to help the, the the kid deal with 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 these questions that any kid has. Yeah, Derek, frankly, your final word. frankly, looking looking at this particular show, I doubt that the kids have any meaningful question about the penis, other than "Daddy, do you have such a three meter long penis as well?" <laughs> so it's it's this this thing looks basically to me it so looks silly and tasteless. With regards to exposing kids to 
the human body in general you can just go to the museum and see a greek statue and you see a dick right there and that's not a problem either so it's um the context matters the story matters what we expose them to matters and uh as you said if it's if it's an educational content i much rather prefer them being exposed to educational content rather than when they are nine years old and get their first smartphone discovering rape porn on the internet so it's uh um, I I see it as a tool to build up resilience, to have a healthy relationship to what the world is about. And I think it's a misguided idea that we have to keep things away from children to protect them. We have to we have to be mindful what we expose them to. That's basically the better frame of mind. All right. If I, excellent. If I can just uh, add a one final thing, I think I actually think that sex sex ed should be much much more developed i feel like uh all over the world we are doing way too little to to educate our kids on se- on but of course sexuality. we are very we are very um, european in that particular view we are all aligned in that view but i think that it's not hard and we don't have to travel far to find places yep. of this planet where people would tell us nothing of what we just said made no sense no way in hell <laughs> yeah 90% of the planet would, would say no way in hell, even if the three of us agree. All right, we're <laughs> done with our motions today. Now for the fun part. You can be serious or fun or funny in your answers. We will have the interview, the if I were president interview. Five questions. I'll give you three, Dirk, and I'll give you two, Lydia. Uh, and you will have to answer the way you want, as brief as possible. Uh, you have not seen or heard the questions before. I have prepared them. This is for the fun ending of this podcast. And then we'll have two trivia questions, one for each. All right, Dirk, are you ready? I was born ready. Always born ready. All right. If you were president, Dirk, what would be the first law that you would get adopted by parliament? The very first law. You can choose the country where you'd be president. A free alpaca for every citizen. Can you elaborate as to why an alpaca for every citizen? Alpacas are proven... Dead or alive, by the way. Sorry, what was that? Dead or alive? <laughs> the alpaca. <laughs> uh, alive. Alive. All right. So that's um, the only person on this planet to be able to think of that question. <laughs> yeah, well, alpacas are proven to be uh, have a calming effort. They make you peaceful. They are cute. There are not enough alpacas on this planet, and I do I do support the alpaca movement. And as an elected president, I would put everything in my power towards uh, getting free alpacas for every citizen. All right. Thank you for that answer. Lydia, <laughs> if you were president, now, the context is as follows. The Dalai Lama is staying in your country. If you meet, meet with him... China cancels for $100 billion or euros of various imports from your country. What do you do? <laughs> I meet him. <laughs> Why would you meet with him? Because that would mean the direct cancellation of the 100 billion euros of worth of uh, imports coming from your country or exports from your country. The Dalai Lama is uh, the symbol for many people of peace, of uh, tolerance. And the Tibetan people have been, uh, um, how do you say? Um, oh, sorry, I, I need to find my words. Um, the question is, if he's the symbol of peace, does he come with an alpaca? I would, <laughs> I would say, I would say she, uh, you should totally meet him. And as a friendly come uh, as a as a, car, a country that's friendly to your country and your presidency, we would support you with a free shipment of alpacas to compensate so for the hundred million. With so free alpacas for everybody, <laughs> so that they have warm clothes with the alpaca <laughs> and happiness. The GDP would probably be decreasing by ten percent with this loss in exports. All right, Dirk, a question for you: You're president of the country. And Putin, Vladimir, Vladimir, our friend, dies. I don't know why I use an Indian accent for this Russian, but it's okay. You're invited to the funeral. Do you go? Of course I go. So that's well, a, ser- go? a serious answer. Is uh, um, pay it should it should never be a scandal or a problem to pay the the respects to to somebody. And I think yeah, I would pay my respects. 
All right, Lydia, question to you. You're the president. Listen carefully. An intern at your office has an affair with you. What do you do? Hmm. <laughs> do I really like him or is it just like a fling? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. If it's a fling, then I stop it. If it's serious, then I wait until either he's not my it, intern anymore it, or I'm not president anymore. Do you hide it from public opinion in that case or does it depend on whether it's a fling or, an, or something more serious? Is that what you're saying? I wasn't even thinking about public opinion. I was, I was just thinking about the relationship. So whatever the context, presidential or otherwise, uh, if you're in a position of power on somebody, having a love affair with him is probably not the best uh, for a healthy relationship. So if it's a thing, then probably I wouldn't have done it at all at the, in the first place. Uh, if it's right. serious, then it can wait until this is... You can promote you can promote your affair to being the the minister of alpaca affairs in your country, and that way <laughs> you share the power, and it's not that big a deal anymore. And so yeah, there's more equality, and yes. and there's no. All right, all right, all right. We've done with alpacas. You have one one more question, Dirk. It's for you. Uh, your supporters storm the parliament of your country. How do you react? That would really surprise me because with alpacas that wouldn't happen. <laughs> but they, it did happen they actually came with alpacas they were riding the alpacas right through to the parliament and stormed and destroyed windows and five people died Why, how do you react what do you do serious or not serious it's up to you so on the serious backstory of that if I were president and this happened I would I would first off not delay a forceful response. I would have prepared earlier because um, I would have uh, given orders to police um, to protect the the capital at all cost. And I would I would be the second this happens in front of cameras and condemn that because it's maybe one of the most dangerous moments that you have. Uh, transition of power moments are the moments where where uh, governments historically have been spiraled into chaos, and this. As a elected president, it's my duty to defend that moment to the best of my ability. Yeah, and I, I, I don't believe for a second that they were riding on alpacas. That only can be fake news because alpacas are the most calm, friendly animals there are. And if you're sitting on an alpaca, you cannot really be serious in storming anything. I mean, have you what heard how they make what sounds they make? I mean, imagine, imagine you 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 gallop into the capital and you hear something like all the time. Uh, like, I'll, I'll probably make you sad, but the only alpacas I have seen are in my plate when I was traveling through Peru, uh, eight and a half, eight and a half years boo, ago. They eat a lot of alpacas boo, there. You're the enemy, enemy of the state. Sorry, but they have a lot <laughs> of them. Sebastian from Twitter, Facebook, uh, Google. Yeah, I don't yes. know much. Because he's been mean to alpacas. Yeah, oh, sorry. All right, trivia questions, and we'll we'll have a mammal question for you, Dirk, <laughs> since you you love animals. Question for you. So, trivia question, and we'll close off uh, the podcast with those questions. Uh, Lydia, after the Mona Lisa was stolen from the Louvre in 1911, which famous artist was considered a suspect? Wow. Um... The Mona Lisa was stolen in 1911. So I have to come up with an artist that is contemporary of that, right? Because otherwise so I look I like a fool. I'll give you a few names. There was Degas, Picasso, Apollinaire, O'Keefe. The suspect is among them. It's Cluedo. Okay. You want to give a shot? I'd go with O'Keefe. Yeah, O'Keefe. I'd go with O'Keefe. All right, the only immigrant name in that list. Nice, nice. I well, should have something in my head about Egypt and the Mona Lisa, but I the can't quite remember what it's about. Is Pablo Picasso was considered the suspect. He was actually not the thief. The reason why he was um, involved in this affair is because he had been sold stolen pieces of art. Uh, so the connection was possibly made that way. But actually... The person who stole the Mona Lisa was an Italian immigrant. Uh, he was the person who replaced the glass above the painting. And he stole it because it looked like an ex-lover. Aww. 
That's oh. a nice story. Well, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> Mona Lisa is not a, anyway, not the stereotype of beauty in 2021, but you know, maybe in 1911, who knows? He went seven months in jail for that. <laughs> All right. Question for you. It's a tough question. I have a question for you, Dirk. When scientists first saw specimens of that Australian mammal, they thought it was a hoax. Since you love fake news and alpacas, what animal was that? Oh, I, I know the animal, I believe, but I don't know the English word for it. It's that animal that looks like a crossover between a duck and, uh, and, uh, um, and um, uh, a... a um, yeah, it, uh, and it's it's the, it's the only it's mammal correct. that still lays eggs and uh, and uh, yeah, it has like bird feet and all that. Um, what what good the, answer, but you don't know the name. The name is platypus. Thank you. Platypus. Yeah, it's in German, by the way, it's a schnabeltier. Which, oh, of course, it <laughs> sounds so lovely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, no offense to German language, which I love, obviously. Go ahead, Dirk. Dirk. What what is uh, what do you call the 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 piece uh, the the bird's mouth? <laughs> Um, the bill. I believe you call it the duck bill. I'm not bill. sure about that. Yeah, so yeah. schnabeltier means more or less animal with a bill. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So, all right. Yeah, that's the one. So, uh, the other choices that if you cannot guess would have been kangaroo or I believe you say echidna, which is this bizarre mammal uh, with a four headed penis, which we talked about penis just uh, before. Uh, <laughs> that's the echidna. Uh, but no, it was indeed the platypus. And the reason why they thought it was a hoax in 1799, do you know why they thought it was fake news? I don't know. Because at the time, there were a lot of fake specimens of various animals, right? And this was a dead platypus that was shipped to England, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they did not actually go to Australia. It was shipped all the way. And because it was traveling through India... Uh, where a lot of fake samples were originating from at that time, they could not believe that it could be that combination of weird animal with this duck uh, bill. Anyway, that's the trivia question. That's it. That's the episode. So are you, are you saying question. Go ahead. Are you saying that people would actually engineer uh, like fake animals and present them as new species, like take yep. a... I don't know, a lion's head and put it on an elephant or something or whatever. I, yeah. I suspect that's that, the reason. Would that, that actually People would actually spend time to actually create fake animals. I don't know. I guess it's a thing. Uh, but I did investigate the answer because I, I, had, I had the trivia question. I had the answer. And I thought, hey, what the heck? So I went to see this a bit in more detail. It took them 100 years, by the way, to figure, it, to figure the, the truth out uh, about that platypus, by the way. It, didn't it was not overnight that they figured it out. What are you showing us? This is a German animal? <laughs> uh, yeah. is displaying a, a photo of a rabbit with, what is it, like antlers and, yeah. and, and wings, like angel wings, the duck wings. Yeah, this, this, is, is this is called a Wolperdinger in Germany. And it's like a mythical animal where everyone knows it's not existing. But it's, uh, um, I, I guess, uh, people in former times believed this would, uh, would possibly be around. And if you think about it, there are, there are tons of depictions of animals like this. Think about the Sphinx. Um, it's like, a, a, you know, animal body, wings, uh, so, or, or the Minotaur or, or whatever. So it's like, I, I totally see a world where people start making, making things like this up. Here's another one. <laughs> oh, this is beautiful. Yeah. As a fake resemblance, I think I'm going to have nightmares. Tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess we need to wrap up. Uh, we finished this uh, first episode of our new series. I guess it went pretty well. I guess I pressured you on time. Maybe you'll hate me for that, but you'll probably thank me, Dirk, when you're doing the editing because you are uh, master of the audio editing. So I feel you'll you'll thank me for not having 500 hours of audio to edit. Uh, but I'm pretty happy with this episode. A bit long, but pretty exciting. What do you think, both of you? Lydia, will you come back to us? <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been pretty nice with me today. I think you you've you've not been at your at your best in uh, in um, how do you say the peak? Um, uh, help me on this, Sebastian. How do you attacks. gentle attacks? Well, yeah. 
Yeah, I've, I haven't been too much attacked, so I think it's safe to come back. And to oh, we created psychological, jump, psychological, psychological safety. The, the new role <laughs> that you've, you've left me. Yeah, so I oh, think we're it gonna was, end the music. I think uh, we we produced an inaugurational inaugural. We produced an inaugural episode worthy of the start for the second season. So to debate in a new flavor, more fun, more free-flowing conversations, and more music. Sebastian, you promised to show to, to demonstrate your ukulele skills. Uh, I, you know, private, I haven't practiced in concert. Online concert. Yep. Uh, let me see if I can put my microphone at the level of my ukulele, which is coming, Good. as you probably know, from Hawaii. Uh, and you should say ukulele, not ukulele, actually, if you pronounce it correctly. In Hawaiian spelling, it even has an apostrophe before the first U. So it's apostrophe ukulele. Yeah, ukulele. I know about all this shit. Now. Yeah, in German, you say right. ukulele too. Let me see. Okay, I stop as soon as you recognize what it is. All right? As soon as I'm you not know saying anything. Right. Me I, neither. I, I, we I let him play saying. until he dies from exhaustion. Uh, great. Fantastic. <laughs> Let me see. <laughs> All right, so I, I'll tell you bye now because you're gonna you're gonna let me play until I never finish, right? Um, <laughs> All right, I feel nervous now because I never play. Hang on, I need to put this over my shoulder, otherwise I'm gonna drop it. Um, oh shoot, sorry. Not Beautiful blowing, Sebastian. Again. You don't have to blow. It's almost like a guitar, you know. Yeah, I know. It's almost like a guitar. It's just for it's just for kids. All right, let me see if I can do this. You tell me if you recognize it. You recognize this? Because I messed up. I'm not comfortable. You have to delete this segment. I have this earpiece coming in my. I need to remove it. Hang on. (laughs) (laughs) Somewhere over the rainbow. Because I'm a bit nervous now since I never performed for anyone else. Uh, And And now you're crap. In front of Two Debate Nation, you basically had your debut. That's very good. I, thank you, thank you for that private concert. We're oh, all in right. need of, of yeah. um, I mean, performing uh, you're in, arts. You're in charge of playing our intro music now. All right, great, fantastic. <laughs> okay, should we very wrap cool. up? And our listeners, you tune back in in a couple of weeks. We'll have uh, an, an another episode uh, available for you. That's it. Tell us what you think. Email us. And that's about it. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you for having me. And see you in uh, a month then. Yes. For what's and what concerns me. Yes. Very much looking forward to that. And if our listeners want to be on the show or have feedback or motions to suggest or weird questions that we can ask the next president of uh, to debate or whatever uh, recommendation suggestion you want to want to send us mail at to debate.eu or to debate.net both actually work or comments on the page go a long way I can actually testify that Sebastian and Dirk are less um, intimidating uh, as as you could actually think when you listen to the debates. They actually let you speak, which is <laughs> a surprise. So, <laughs> yeah, do do email if uh, <laughs> if if you want to participate. It, it was really really nice to be here with you guys. Like All right, cool. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Day.